transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father,
frailty we have brought upon ourselves, we may be delivered by your bountiful goodness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Ten birds. 
virgins, who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the gospel reading, dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And I am saying to you that this mystery is profound, but it refers to Christ and his church. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 30 to 32. When the Bible talks about the bridegroom, this is not some metaphor. It isn't as if God has to liken himself to our love. Your marriage, if you are married, is actually a picture of God's love. Reality depends on God's love, not ours. He defines love. He is love. And so when the Bible says or describes Jesus as a bridegroom, as it does in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, the Psalms, all of the evangelists, St. Paul and St. John, when they call Jesus the bridegroom, this is not some kind of analogy. Jesus is the bridegroom who comes for you, his bride, the church. So says the gospel in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. This is Jesus when he left his heavenly home the first time and came down and became man and shed his blood for you. Make no mistake about it, God has not prepared hell for you. Rather, Jesus said before he left the first time, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that where I am, you may be also. That is Jesus describing his return on the last day, the day which our church service looks forward to. This last Sunday of the church year would call your attention for everyone to look in hope to the last day of this world. It will come like a thief in the night, and none of you should be off guard. None of you should be caught unaware. None of you should be caught without oil. The ten virgins, now this is a parable, but... It refers and makes sense if we understand Israelite wedding custom. In Israelite marriage, you were to be betrothed, usually at an early age, and you were probably arranged to be married by your parents. So when we see Joseph and Mary betrothed to one another, this isn't out of the blue, but it is quite normal often the bride would be betrothed at an early age, and so there would be a time of waiting, both for her and also for the groom to prepare money or a gift, a dowry to the bride's family. The groom would also work in preparing a home for his bride. This is likely in the parable why the groom is delayed. He's working, working to give the bride a gift working to prepare the bridal chamber so that it would be beautiful and fitting for a lady. So Jesus, when he says, in my house 
In my Father's house there are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you, is showing us how he really is the groom, upon which all Israelite marriages were based off of. Jesus doing all the work preparing eternal life for you. This is all gospel so far. And yet, the sting of the law is quite clear in the parable, isn't it? If you're found without oil, the door will be shut, and God himself will say, I do not know you. What a chilling imagination here. A chilling picture of what will be on the last day for those who are found without the oil of faith. That is what the oil represents. So how would you ever be caught without oil? You believe in Jesus. You just confessed Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You sing this song of joy, wake, awake, for you believe Jesus will return. But the foolish virgins were caught without faith, thinking they had enough. Christian, don't ever think you're done. Don't ever think you've got plenty. I'll eat, drink, and be merry. For your soul will be required of you. How foolish it was for the hare to think he had the race in the bag. And so he takes a nap and gets beat by a turtle. Don't ever think you've already completed everything that God has called you to do. Christian, you're never done as so long as God has you on this earth. You're never done learning the scriptures. You're never done praying. You're never done loving and seeing the needs of your neighbors around you. Only a fool would think he's retired from Christian living and from Christian receiving of God's gifts. Christ instituted his church so that whether you live a hundred years, more or less, all your years and all your days would be filled with faith given to you from his word and from his sacraments. God always has more sins of yours to forgive. He's not done with you yet. So to be one like the foolish virgins without oil is to think that you're done. It was the virgin's job, like bridemaids, to light the way for the groom to meet his bride, to see her just like the first time maybe when you were married and those back doors swung open and for the first time bride and groom see each other. What a killjoy it would be if all the lights went out at that point, right? It isn't as if the groom can't find the bride. No, he'll find her. He'll walk all night in the dark in order to find her and bring her to the bridal chamber. But it was, it was the bridesmaid's job to light the way so it would be all the more joyous. It's your job, Christians, in your faithful coming to hear God's word, in your life of love, to illumine the way of Christ to your neighbors. When they see you praying, when they see you helping, when they see you giving, when they see you coming faithfully to hear the word of your Lord, they are pointed to Christ. This is how you encourage one another and build one another up. That you would always be found here, faithful Christians, receiving forgiveness, and be found in the world, in your jobs, in your homes, in public, with love and patience and gentleness.
Now, our church has received a gift. You've seen it in the bulletins and maybe gotten emails about it. And let me be clear, no one can purchase ad space in a sermon. And I don't want to do a commercial for Ramsey or Dave Ramsey. However, just as none of us are done learning or doing good works or lighting the way of your neighbors to Christ, so only a fool would think that he's done learning. We cannot purchase this oil. It's given to us by grace as a gift here in God's church where Jesus prepares your hearts for eternal life and the new heaven and the new earth. But we do have work to do. And there is more all of us can learn in Christian stewardship. To be given a gift of simple, biblical, faithful stewardship and not take advantage of it, not check it out, it's not necessarily a sin, but it would be foolish. So when the announcement comes at the end of church or in Bible class, please know that your salvation doesn't depend on how much you give in God's house or how good of a steward you are on earth. But if you, if you like me know, there's always more I can learn. If you, like me as a Christian, want to continue to support the gospel here and love your neighbor throughout your life, then maybe this tool of Ramsey isn't a bad idea to check out. Please consider it. And then we can stop talking about money so much and start talking about God's salvation. Now this is always the point of every sermon. Christ purchased the time in every preaching so that you would know God loves you. God loves you in a specific way that Christ would bleed and die and save you and rise to come again for you. This is the fun part. Augustine says that when the virgins fall asleep, this is death. Because the bridegroom, he comes, he comes once at midnight, yeah? But all the virgins fall asleep on their own. This is you dying one day. And of course, that's, that death is not in itself a sin. It just happens to all of us sinners. But then, it says, the cry comes, and all the virgins rose. This is the resurrection on the last day. Note that Jesus can raise you from the dead as easy as someone can be roused by their alarm clock on Sunday morning or Monday morning. So Jesus, when he goes to heal the little daughter of Jairus at her house... He says she's just sleeping, and everyone laughs at Jesus, and then he raises her from the dead, just like that. Jesus will raise you from the dead easily, for he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And there are plenty of stories that teach us about this, sort of like the parable of the ten virgins, stories you've heard and stories you've told or watched with your children, stories that are good and better than others. How are you going to teach your children about the last day or of your Savior? Well, sometimes it's right before your eyes and you don't even realize it. In Sleeping Beauty, the wicked fairy casts a spell on Aurora, who in a trance pricks her finger on the spinning wheel and falls into sleep that seems to have no end. If you prefer a different tale, the wicked witch uses a piece of fruit 
to do the same to Snow White. Fruit, sleep, death. Sounds familiar. Now, the feminists want to do something and take these stories away. They tell you to get rid of these old-fashioned stories and adopt new ones where women don't need a prince charming to save them or virgins don't need a groom to celebrate. They would have you watch where two frozen sisters can save themselves. I'm not telling you exactly what genre to watch or tell your children when you want to watch a good story. But I would ask you, if you're going to have a good time with your family, do you want to hear or tell a story that aligns with Jesus' picture of salvation that we can do nothing to save ourselves, but that it is a hero that will rescue us? Or do you want to tell a story that could destroy the picture of salvation? It's not just romance. It is a true picture of God's love for you. So we cannot go along with gay marriage or transgenderism or any other picture of true love than one that shows a man who would give up all things to fight for his bride. These stories, these old-fashioned ones that you know quite well, is not to perpetuate some battle of the sexes. Neither men or women can save themselves. Really, they are stories that point to the last day and the current battle now against evil. We have all taken the bait. We are all sick and falling asleep on our own schedule. And there is only one who can come and do battle against the ancient dragon for us. Only one can come and wake us from the sleep of death with his kiss of peace. Only one who can enter death and come and take us out of it, that where he is, we may be also. And that one is Jesus Christ, your Savior, and the one who truly knows how to love you. And you are his sleeping beauty, and he will wake you to save you. Sleeping beauty whose name was Aurora, which means light. And you light his way by faithfully receiving his forgiveness every day. Or if you prefer, Snow White. And he will present you to his father without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any stain of sin. Now I'm saying this mystery is profound. We cannot understand God's love for us. But it does refer to Christ and the church. He is the real bridegroom, and you are his bride, and he is coming again to take you, the fairest of them all, to eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God.
Let us pray for our beloved, the Christ, to come again and take us to himself, that where he is, we may be also. Heavenly Father, you give us a picture of salvation through earthly marriage. We thank you for Steve and Sheila Yago and all who celebrate their anniversaries for this picture of your love for us. Send forth your Son, we pray, to lead home his bride, the church, that with all the company of the redeemed, we finally enter your marriage feast. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, our hope is in you. Grant all pastors and servants of the church to proclaim that hope in boldness and clarity. Lord, in your mercy. Grant all your baptized people diligence to watch for their Savior's appearing, that in holy living and in lives of love, we faithfully steward whatever you give to us to care for our neighbor and to glorify your name. Lord, in your mercy. King of the nations, hear our prayers for all our leaders, those who serve us in the military and all who protect our freedom. Fill them with wisdom and protect them in every danger and grant that they fight the good fight revealed by your law of love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you promise everlasting joy to your people. Remember all who mourn now that they would be comforted with the hope of eternal life. So we pray for Carl Becker, Callie Benning, Linda Crane, Jason Carraway, Tiffany Dunaway, Bernice Grommans, Tim Mueller, Luella Rubin, Karen Stimke, Steve Velker, Jean Wharton, Lynn Winter, Lily Wright, and all who suffer. Lord, in your mercy, giver of the feast, you provide for us the divine wedding banquet of your son's table. Grant repentance and faith to all who commune this day, that they receive your body and blood in a worthy manner, and show forth praise in their lives. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, you know all things. Make us thankful this week for all that we've received in our country and grant us thankfulness throughout all our days that we live in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another and receive your gift by grace through faith of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary. We should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying.
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you of your mercy. You strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Sorry, too many books, <laughs> lost my announcements. <laughs> Please refer to some of the announcements that are written in your bulletin. Just one of those mornings, yeah? No batteries and everything, but it's good to be in God's house. Last Sunday of the church here, remember uh, we have uh, plenty of things that are the typical Sunday afternoon schedule uh, as far as cantata practice adult catechesis in the evening, and of course, Sunday school right after. Is there a specific uh, instructions for the children program practice? After Sunday school, 1130 practice at church. Starting today. If you didn't get that memo, yep. Uh, the more helpers or uh, anyone that can stay and, and help, that's fine. Um, I wanted to say, normally on Tuesday evenings, I have a Bible class, that's true, this Tuesday. <clears throat> However, the following Tuesday, um, I'm going to take uh, my boys to Vandalia, and they're having a carpool or even a, uh, uh, their church bus go down to St. Louis for the prayer service for life, and for the Concordia Seminary, um, their choir is doing an Advent uh, carol, so uh, if you'd like to join me with that, please let me know. They need reservations for the Service for Life that's at the Missouri Senate International Center. So if you're interested at all, that will be Tuesday afternoon into Tuesday evening, November 30th. Remember, there's Thanksgiving service Thursday, 930. Thanks for all the decorations for the Thanksgiving service and this time of the church year. Probably forgetting something. Are there other announcements? Yeah, I know I remembered. You know, we've talked a lot about money this year, and I want to remind you two things. First, the priority of all the money talk isn't give more, or to harp on that, we are blessed with a congregation that's generous. We want to support the young families and not just say, hey, we've got money problems, but actually offer them something that might help with just money management. So the district gave that gift, uh, all you have to do is go to our church website, and it's one click, and you basically get access to what's called Ramsey Plus. Again, I know you're probably tired of hearing about all this stuff, and frankly, we're tired of talking about it. So, um, I just want to encourage you, okay, to check it out, but you don't have to. We're going to talk about it at a Bible class and just show you kind of how it works, and I look forward to next year uh, having a theme and focus that is both joyful and supports you at Christian living. Please stand for the recessional. 